Welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere, where CEOs, leaders, and experts at building teams, companies, organizations, and amazing cultures share how to lead from anywhere in the world. I'm your co-host on the East Coast, Ginny Bianco Mathis. And I'm your co-host on the West Coast, Mitch Simon. And we invite you to join us to Team Anywhere. Today, we welcome back Rachel Casanova from Cushman and Wakefield, a brilliant conversation on how to think about approaching work, especially as many companies will start dipping their toes in the water of bringing people back to the office. Number one, we will be reboarding people. Let's treat everyone as a new employee and let's be extremely clear on our purpose and what we believe in at our company. Number two, we will all be in this reboard together. This will be the time for all of us, manager to team member, team members to each other, to be authentic and vulnerable about what the business needs and what each team member needs to be successful. And number three, no one has the answers. The best approach is to look at everything moving forward as a two-week sprint. Finally, let's get this reboard right. Your team members will be coming out of their warm caves at home. Let's make it worth their while to come back to the office. You are going to absolutely love this episode of Team Anywhere. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Team Anywhere. I'm Mitch Simon on the West Coast. And with me is my co-host, Ginny Bianca Mathis on the East Coast. She's actually in Florida today. Yeah, Florida. (laughs) Florida. And also on the East Coast, really on the East Coast, uh, we have back on the podcast, Rachel Casanova, Senior Managing Director of Workplace Innovation at Cushman and Wakefield, a leading global real estate service firm. Now, we had Rachel on a, as a guest on episode five, and that episode is still our most downloaded episode. Uh, this week, we actually reached 2,000 downloads. Thank to you, thanks to all of our great guests. Now, I'm so excited to have Rachel because what's keeping me up at night um, is is how do people take this new world and really translate it into their real estate and creating places for people to thrive and come back to if they're coming back, are they always coming back, never coming back, half, half, I don't know, but Rachel does. So we hope she does. So Rachel, so excited to have you back on the podcast. I think this is six months since we had you on. How have you been? I am doing well. I'm going to tell you, it's a spoiler alert. I don't have the answers, but I have some insights Mm. that might lead you to define your own answers about what you think are going to happen. Um, We've just, it's amazing how the last six months, even before that, the six months prior, it's been two week intervals of changing the human psyche, of changing the news, of the priorities. So you're getting me today. And if we did this in two weeks, um, we might be in a different place. But as we've watched, you know, first it was testing, then it was vaccinations, then it's a vaccine that a vaccine that comes off the market, goes back on, the social unrest. Like there are so many things. And and we are boiling this down to work. And yet as humans, we are multidimensional and we are consumers and we are citizens and we are workers. And I think that that's this moment that is incredibly interesting that those worlds are really, all of them are equally important. We can't be absent to the others and just say, well, what happens with work? I love that. Has there anything that you've learned um, this year that has just absolutely surprised you, rocked your world, wasn't expecting? Um, I'll give you the, the first answer is yes. One of the things I think we never would have anticipated is that people could make decisions in two week intervals that we were so used to the plot of a movie where there's, you know, the intro, there's the antagonist and the protagonist, and then there's the conclusion. And in two hours you get to the end. And we have had to see ourselves get used to this multi high, this multi, um, the middle of the movie keeps happening. The end is not here. But, you know, I say to my children, when is school over? They said, we don't know. It's not, it's not clear when tests are going to be and when the end of school is, and they've changed their system of when they go to school and when they don't numerous times. And the 
the response from people at first was, how could they do this? Why don't they know? And now there's just a recognition. I'm going to go back to that news source because I'm going to get updated and in, and in acceptance in some ways. Um, so that's a bit surprising to me and uplifting because I think uh, as you think about how we're looking at the future, I don't think the future is the conclusion. I don't think mm-hmm. we're going to close the book. It's going to be a choose your own adventure and there's going to be so many paths. And we're going to, this is a moment of learning and of significant change that in hindsight might look clear, but this this response, this answer is going to take, I think, many forms. Well, it's almost living with ambiguity. People are which is so hard psychologically and yet they're going, what else do, can I do? Yeah. So and I'll embrace it. I mean, I, you only see what you see, but I would, I would say that the, the banter about that frustration has lessened and you might be upset about one decision, but there's a recognition. It might not be the last one. Um, the CDC, you know, who would expect that we would allow the CDC of all entities to change their mind. And we've had to, so I think that that's exciting. And I, as I compare that to the world of work, I think of it in the digital agile development mindset where we do some research, we get some ideas, we test those ideas, we go back and refine them. When we think about our, our interaction with our mobile phones, you bought the device, but you have agency to make that device look and act as you want it to. My old reference was Nike. Let me design with their swoosh what I want my shoes to look like. And so there's this there's this newfound kind of understanding of process that is not define the problem, go answer it and live with it. It's go answer it. And as we know better, just let's keep going, which is completely antithetical to the real estate industry and the architectural. Yeah, industry. That's true. So I guess uh, what I'm getting is um, that, you know, every company to really be successful in this new world is to really take on agile principles and say, okay, so let's look at this next two weeks is a sprint. That's right. Don't have any idea what's going to be happening two weeks later. So what can we focus on right now and make it work? Yeah, we're working with a client who is, I would say, on the forefront of solving their workplace question. And But they specifically said, this is a pilot. There wasn't a period at the end of it or an exclamation point. I think the pilot is sort of long. It's a September to June pilot, but they've come out with a point of view and the recognition is they're going to learn. Don't go making major life decisions based on this. We're going to test this solution. And they've been just very clear about what that is and they're going to see. Um, so I don't know the question you asked initially, but of what I know, um, What I know is that we're going to have to adopt a sit back, recognize you're not going to have the answer. There is not one. There wasn't one answer before. There is not one answer now. Stay calm. Kind of don't don't play into the the fury of what it feels like. And there's so much being written around this in the mainstream media that everyone's talking about it. I talk to my parents about it. I go out to dinner. It's the conversation. I go to work. It's the conversation. This too shall pass. The pendulum will come back, might take a slightly different angle, but <clears throat> slow and steady, I think has a lot of merit. What does, uh, what is a business owner to do? What, what, what do you think, um, successful managers and business owners have been doing to, um, have their employees confront this let's say two week sprint situation or, and not having the answers. Cause again, you know, uh, every podcast wants to come out with, and these are the three things that you should do. And then Rachel with all of her, her gall comes on and says, there are no answers, Mitch. <laughs> so what, 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 what could you do to help uh, managers who are living through this right now? Some suggestions. So the first thing is communication and the expectation for, from, for communication just continues to grow with authenticity. So, you know, being able to say, I don't know, within reason, not I don't know, and I hope it works out, but I don't know, but here's what I do know. But that authenticity is so important right now. Um, I think the other thing from a business perspective is we have to allow businesses to have their objectives. We have really swung the messaging towards the individual, and I would not undo that. 
but this is about your mental health and your strength and your ability to do great work and what you need. But I also think that the context has to be within where the business is trying to go. And even if their employees aren't asking for that, I think it gives rationale to any decisions that they do make. And I'm not saying don't make any decisions. Some companies have some clarity and they know what they want. I am suggesting it's okay if you're not right. Be authentic with we're going to try this. Do something. I think the first thing we have to encourage is behavior. Is um, There is an expression a colleague said of FOGO, fear of going out. And so I, I actually think if employers said, we want you to come back once in the month of May, even though employees aren't saying they will do that, I think getting their feet going. And I think employers right now have this opportunity to help people because when left left to their own decision making, I, I've seen it, the fear of how do I get to the city in New York? How do I, like, I don't know how to get on a train anymore. What's going to happen when I get there? And that fear of anticipation, I think, may be greater than the than what happens. So I that's think it. I do yeah, think it. that leaders have an opportunity to say something. Yeah. So you're you know you're really um, uh, putting out there for leaders to challenge and provoke their employees to like come out of the cave. And I'm I'm assuming that there will be some employees that are like, gosh, I need some direction, and then there will be some employees that say. How dare he or she tell me what to do? Because, quote unquote, the world's coming to a, coming apart, and if I go to work, it's going to be horrible. Right, but this is no different, right? We know that adoption of things. There are people who are back who can't understand why there's an issue, and there are people who would respond to what we're talking about. And there's a big middle who's going to say, "How did it go? I'm waiting." And I don't think it should be without exception for that person who says, "I can't." Um, I won't, I have a responsibility, I'm a caregiver, things like that. So I'm not saying to ignore those issues, but I think a little bit of suggestion might go a long way. And the other thing that the that has to happen is those organizations have to think about what it takes to make a great experience. So if I did it and it was terrible and I came in and you weren't prepared and, you know, Though you come back and you see things on whiteboards that are a year old and it feels stale and uncomfortable, that's not going to work. So if, if the first thing is to make the suggestion of getting their feet moving, the next is to ensure that it was worth it. Tough task. But we talked about this last time, thinking like a consumer. So what would make it great? I walked in, I've been in my office a few times, but I walked in, there was a bag of of stuff. It was, it was cleaning materials mostly, but it was well done and it was a note and it was, you know, things that made me feel comfortable. Um, I know one organization who actually had someone, not really a scalable solution, but who went and took pictures of people's desks and sent it to them before they came, right? They, they were onboarding corporate America, everyone. So make it easy. Um, think about something as simple as food or something else that made my life easier. And just imagine that everyone is almost like a new employee when it comes to this. Oh, I love that. You're almost onboarding, reboarding, reboarding. Yeah, reboarding. Reboarding. Yeah. That was the word, Jenny, that was the word that we used as we, when we met. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not not a very common story, but. <laughs> yeah. And then what this reminded me of is realizing People have created a, their new infrastructure, right, of this virtual half in, half out. Now, if what does going back mean, that's another change. Yes, entirely. And I, I like change and I have welcomed it. So, But I do recall my first day taking the train from the suburbs of New York City and going in and and watching what the, how the system worked. Now, I don't think that that's my employer's responsibility, but I will tell you there are employees who are absolutely saying, what are you, my employer, going to do to make that experience easier and better? So the responsibility is being pushed earlier. Um, the question of, well, what am I going to do about childcare? There were just, there was 
an expectation that when I get hired, my job is to figure out how I get to work, how I take care of my responsibilities, right? Like that wasn't the employer's job. Right now, those questions are being talked about, uh, which I find fascinating. And I'm not sure what employers want to take on. Oh, that is very, oh, thanks for sharing that. That's just uh, blowing my mind right now, how that just shifted. So how are you going to help me with this? That's right. And we haven't even gotten to how often do I come in? Like, we haven't even gotten to that question, but that's the one that everyone's talking about. That last mile is the first thing, or the first mile on the last mile, the how do I get out of my house? And how do I get that last mile to work? And obviously, depending on the market, and if I drive, I have a different expectation. But um, so that's one you asked me for some right takeaways. That's one. The next one Uh, we can anticipate that day one will not be a single day. So we're going to see this progression and whether we call it hybrid or not, we're not going to flip a switch to the final state, which means we are necessarily going to have people in the office and not in the office on any given day. We didn't have a great technology, ubiquitous technology solution in most environments before COVID. So picture that time that you went and someone wasn't in the room and someone needed to have a screen share and so on. And it quickly amounts to someone get IT. I can't get all of this to work. We transitioned sometimes clumsily, but we got there that with one click, I can see you. I can share my screen. You can hear me other than the mute button, which continues to plague people, but it is a one click solution. When people come back into the office and go into that meeting room, let's assume it's a safe environment, we can do this and experience that. It is going to be a train wreck. (laughs) How else do I say train wreck? Um, The frustration, the lost time, the why don't I just go back to my desk or home? The mainstream media says, how do you include the people who are at home? But I would challenge that to say it's both sides. So you may have your most critical people digitally connected, and it's the people who are in the office who need to be involved. Well, what happens, and it has happened to me, where the people who are at home are on at the o'clock. They're ready to go. The people in the room are trying to figure out how to get it done. Oh, we got the audio. We can't get the video, so on and so forth. Their heads are tiny, whereas our heads are equally sized. So one is... The, the obvious one is when people are in the room, how do you help the people who are online? But I would contend the people online may have a superior experience to the ones in the room. And when that room has a booking right after it and they get kicked out, but the people online can continue. So if we don't put some real attention, forget redesigning the office. I don't think that that's the first problem at hand. I think it's the connectivity of people in different environments that we have to solve for, or, or back to that day one experience, we will have a harder time getting them to day two because day one might be so frustrating. Oh, that is so beautiful. I know that even for myself, envisioning what you, (laughs) the nightmare that you just brought out, I already made it clear. And of course they're laughing at me. I'm not going back into the classroom unless I have a tech person with me the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea, actually, Ginny. (laughs) You're absolutely right. My daughter, who's 14, uh, is a tech assistant for a religious school class. And she's exactly that. She's working with second graders who (laughs) fill in the blanks on how crazy that must be. But the teacher spends no time trying to get them into breakout rooms or doing anything Um, making sure the content is shared. She is focused on the students. And my 14-year-old is ensuring this seamless experience. Wow. Can we hire your 14-year-old, Rachel? (laughs) Okay. We would like to do that for our show. That's a great. So um, what you're saying is is it's not going to be pretty when we come back. But on the other hand, Rachel, you're saying you need to make it great when you come back. So I'm, you know, what is, what is a business owner to do here? Um, it's a great question. Uh, I, I don't think either of these are insurmountable. So we just laid out two things to solve for. 
Mm-hmm. And you probably, at, at any scale, you probably have an office manager who just knew the kit, who knew how to make that great or intended to make that great before. It's just that the needs right now are somewhat different. We know what the problem is in the conference room. We know how we need to solve for it. And there's multiple ways you might do that, even in an ad hoc kind of way. Maybe it is that you have audio in the room and everyone comes in with a laptop so their video is on, but you have only one audio feed. Like it's not unfixable, but without intention, it will get messy. And people just want the guidebook. How do I do this? Great, I'm gonna go do it. And I'm I encourage within the right question set, talk to people. So back to agile design, we hypothesize and we go test and we talk to our users. I don't think we need to ask our users a broad question about what would get you back in. But I think, you know, a business leader says, you know, these are the things I think are important. We're going to have lunch on the first day. We're going to make sure that we have cleaning supply, whatever those things are, and then have conversations with your employees or your managers and say, why would this work? Or what won't work? What did we forget? And I think doing that early on, it doesn't have to be sp- sp- like crazy specific. We don't have to get down to persona. It obviously depends on the scale, but you don't need to go through a personas exercise and so on. But think about some basic needs and think about how you might solve for it, what it's going to cost you. So obviously there's an investment there um, and throw it out there. Help people imagine what it's going to be like and find out if that's right and then do it. And I think that whole authenticity, that transparency of how you're thinking about it goes a long way. And brings people along to say, I'll, I'll participate, even the one who's not the one who wants to go out. Well, if you got me some, if I could, if I could have a caregiver on demand on that day, if I could take an Uber to work that day, you know, a jitney idea is, is only works in certain markets, but we certainly saw it on the West Coast before, way before COVID. If I had a jitney that was run by my business and that I could just drive within 10 miles to get on that vehicle and that vehicle takes me to the office, I'd come. Okay, now a business owner has to evaluate the value of everyone being together versus, ah, let's wait it out. And we wouldn't be able to suppose for them the value proposition, um, which I think goes back to with that authenticity, explaining to people why you think it's important. The CEO of JP Morgan, it's in their annual report and why they think it's important for people to come together. Uh, Same thing with Citi, same thing with Amazon and Google. They're all talking about why the value. And that's not new either, right? Think Marissa Mayer with Yahoo 15 years ago. Whether you liked it or not, she was explicit. The reason we're coming back is we're losing time, we're losing innovation, we're losing these things. Um, We have to be okay having that conversation and the duality of what's right for the business and what I as an employee feel is important. Now there's a there's a rub there because what's right for me and what's right for the business don't always fully align. I think we're headed for this rub where we're gonna figure out how companies are gonna manage that. So I have a question. I remember um, uh, I listened to Patrick Lencioni a lot and what Patrick talked about was um, your employees are gonna remember how you treated them when they were all sent home in 2020 seems to me that there's an opportunity now because your, your, your employees who have been at home for let's say 14 months are now going to re engage with the company, the, you know, which is, I think we're, we're talking about, this is almost like your first day at work, right? Reboarding. And the other thing you 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 mentioned in the in, in the uh, in the uh, uh, podcast that we had you on episode five was that business owners need to really treat their their employees like consumers, like more of a retail environment. How does um, how does a business owner uh, you know let's say cater to the needs of individuals who've basically been at their homes um, where you know, if I want to talk to Rachel at 10 o'clock, I can show up, boom, 10 o'clock, it's on. If I want my pizza at 10.05, it's here. Um, if I want my groceries delivered, if I want my laundry delivered, you know, it's I've been able to get everything exactly what I wanted without having to even put gasoline in my car. Right. 
I still have one of those types of cars. How do you think a business owner is going to actually set up expectations where the employee is going to come back, it's going to be messy, and the employee is going to go, gosh, I really want to come back again and see these people. Or you know what? I'm out. I'm going to go find myself an employer that doesn't ask me to um, get my shoes on. So have you heard in on the econ- economic side, this idea of this K, the, the K return, where there was a U, there was a V, the K, the, the K right? economy. Yeah, yeah, the K, right. I think we're going to see this again, where um, some are going to feel that this is great. Like, let's recall that there are cons to what you just described, as well as the pros, just like there were cons to going to work, as well as there were pros. And we're going to see business owners make some decisions on who they who they want to be and how important those individual needs are. There are plenty of organizations who were working in a virtual distributed way before COVID. This is not new, but it is new for those who have depended upon bricks and mortar to do their work. And we're either going to see this great divide between what business leaders want and employees want or we're going to be able to recognize that the pros and cons come with each and we're all going to give a little. And I don't think we know. And I I guess I would go back to what I said before that there's not one answer. I think some businesses are going to do great and thrive. Those that were not maybe ready for this kind of uh, redo are going to struggle and they're going to make that extreme decision because they're going to say, I've got to get a product out the door. I've got to get clients. We're spending so much time debating this. Forget it. Let's just go back to the old way. And and I, I think we, we don't know who's going to end up where. I, I think you're right. I like to come down on that word, uh, giving people more flexibility in that decision. Perhaps that's what we take with us. And that would be different, as you say, as each organization decides what is our personality going to be going forward. Yeah, and I I use the word flexibility we've used for so long that I fear it's misunderstood because we mean so many things. But my word that I've been referring to is agency. And are we going to give people agency? I do also think there's three layers to this. It is an individual agency to make a decision where they're probably going to make a personal prioritization. Then we talk about the business and what they have agency to do and what they need. And I think the missing middle layer, but we have to recognize is that we're in, we're in teams in organizations to work together. And if we're not careful, we're going to jump to just the business or just the individual But agency also has to come at the team level and what works for them. I think we think about the manager who just gets the report from above that says, we're giving agency, people can choose what days they want to come in. And they're going to make those decisions based on their own personal preferences. I want to work from home Monday Monday and Friday. I have childcare issues on Wednesday, whatever those decisions are. Now you've got a manager of a team, team lead, project manager, any of these who is up against the fact that we have a really important deadline, client meeting, say what you want on Friday. And now my employee says, I don't come in on Fridays, but I think you need to be in on Friday. This is a really important time. Nope, that's not what I do. Like we're setting up this potential disaster if we don't figure out and ask the question of teams to make those decisions collectively. Because that's where the work happens. And, and are all of us as peers ready to have the difficult conversations with each other to say, you know, Jenny, it was, it was really hard to follow, find you on Tuesday and we really have this deadline and you seem to, your personal schedule isn't working for the team. That's a hard peer to peer and manager to employee. Yes. I think we're all ready for those conversations. Yeah, and I, also, think, I think, I'm, I'm sorry, I think, no, more. I think um, we're hitting on, um, yeah, I love where this conversation is going. We're, we're hitting, we're hitting on. This is, you know, this is the giant redo, like the, you know, capital R redo, and this is an opportunity, or actually a necessity, that companies and employees get really clear on what they believe in, 
what's what's important to them. Otherwise, this is going to be extremely messy. Um, we need to get you know really clear on on what we believe in, what what do we care about, what's important to us, because that needs to be at the core of our conversations. So, you know, I frankly would love to spend the rest of my life never leaving my house. <laughs> Yet, if my company is about we believe in team and support, and we believe about this this beautiful product or service that we're making, then it's important for us to say you know there's their team is important to us and we frankly don't know what it looks like in this new world but Which let's talk authenticity, about it right so yes and purpose, authenticity and purpose-driven organizations if a purpose-driven organization is explicit about that and hires those who align with that purpose some of this should fall to the background because i and we and they are all, I understand my value proposition in all three of those. Yes, yes, exactly. It also I, means I, what does working at home mean? I will be able to get in touch with you. If we all come to that agreement, being away from the office doesn't mean I'm not working. Yeah, you just made me think of something. I feel like it's more about time working than it is about where working because we can overcome, we can overcome any of these. The the office has just been a default to because I can see you three dimensionally. I know you're there. I know I can ask for something. If I know I have that with you wherever you are in the world, that's not what matters. Time, um, tracking where we are, accountability. But organizations weren't wholeheartedly great at this before COVID. That's what that's what my fear is. That's why the office. I think the office has value in many different ways but the office has value as a catch-all and that we know you're going to be there. So there's a sense that there's a confidence that I can get you when I need you. Think about all the people who worked from home before COVID and the ones who said, I do laundry, this and that. And you're like, Oh, don't talk about this. You're ruining it for everyone. If, If the thought is that when you say you're working from home, you're actually running errands and doing laundry, that's not working from home. That is correct. And it goes back to what you said, Mitch. We have to define that. And it's best to define it together as entities. And it will be different. It's going to be an HR nightmare. <laughs> I, find, I find that the, I know you asked the the where question. I really do think that going forward, we're in, we're in the how question. So the if we are really clear on our purpose, and I really do think that business leaders right now. And that's why I'm working with my clients right now is we need to get super clear on our purpose because then from that question, we can basically say, okay, so this is really important to us. We're going to come into the office. It's going to be messy and that's okay. And we're going to use these, let's say two weeks segments or sections to kind of test stuff and why are we testing this stuff? Because we're going back to our purpose. Um, so it's not a matter of how many days you want to work. This is the conversation we we're having before the podcast. It's not a matter of how many days you want to work. It's really how can we fulfill our purpose? So does it make sense? Are we going to fulfill our purpose by getting in a conference room and all being on our own screens? or having one microphone or whatever, the technology should follow the purpose. And I think that that's, I think, the new redo. I think that's the new game, which is getting really, really clear on that. Long way around why I don't know what I don't know is because the workplace needs to respond to the how, to Mm -hmm. the business. It always has. The reason we designed newsrooms were because paper went from one to the next to the next and it was the most efficient thing. We didn't change the workplace because we thought a workplace could be different, but we changed how we work. We changed that we don't have linear teams that physically hand things from one person to the next. We are involved in things where overhearing conversation was important, right? Where spontaneous conversation is relevant where being able to check in with your colleague, it wasn't anyone saying we should have an open office for the sake of an open office. It might've come with, with its um, damages, but it was done with intention. We are at that moment again, where 
this is forcing business process and workflow to be in question. Maybe even your product and what you offer to your clients has changed. That needs time to become, to solidify so we can figure out how to define the workplace. Real estate in the workplace is the lagger. We don't, you don't get new space without a plan because you were going to grow your business. And I know why it's so tempting and it's the tangible thing that people want the answer to right now, but it's not the place you start. Even when people hypothesize, people are going to come in to collaborate. Maybe, maybe they were doing great. We have an online collaboration world where I can not only have face-to-face communication, but we are using multiple tools and thumbs ups and texts, you know, like a sidebar conversation. This isn't so bad. So yeah, exactly. Right. Like I, I still would like to be next to people. You can stay home, Mitch. I'm going back. But <laughs> um, but there's some great things. So how is that going to change how we collaborate and meet? That needs to be figured out, which is sort of why I say do less than more. Let's use the new capabilities that we now have. Yes, get people to come in, try it out, see where the rubs are, see where the band-aids need to be put. That's how we're going to define successfully where to invest your money. The technology thing I'm just saying is a is a stopgap because we know it's going to frustrate people. But bigger investments, if it's up to me and my buyer is often not the CFO, so that CFO, we've seen plenty out there who say cut it 30%, 40%, we're not using it. And I can understand that in business, that's the way it works. And sometimes we then solve for a cheaper solution. But if we had our druthers, let's really understand how work is happening. We've also, if you read, if you think about reading the news, we are talking about work like it is one thing. When you see these articles, there is little recognition that an engineer of different kinds or a scientist or a salesperson or anyone else might need different things. We've dumbed this down to man to machine and that we're all doing the same thing and we're not. So even more reason, we need open eyes, open ears, we need evidence, we need to watch and then come up with ideas. So I've sort of said we need to do and then strategize, not strategize and then do. I love it. Wow. This has been um, sensational, a sensational, sensational conversation. Totally. And I think, um, you know, if you're looking for answers, I actually got a lot of answers on, on this podcast. I think and a lot of it is. you need to tell me the answers now that I can. I, I really <laughs> do just think. on your summary. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize um, from what I heard, which is, you know, I really do think that Companies need to get very, very clear on, you know, why they do what they do, what they really do care about. Um, And I think that it's time now for uh, company leaders and owners to realize that this next segment is going to be messy. Rachel doesn't have the answers. Ginny doesn't have the answers. I actually have all the answers. I'm kidding. (laughs) Um, You know, we don't have the answers. Oh, Mitch. (laughs) <laughs> the answer, though, is really going to be this um, this newfound confidence in trying stuff out and bringing the employees in to try stuff out. Because the the you know, if I am a company, I've got you know ten engineers and ten marketing people. It's not one size fits all, but there are some things that are collective around our company that we that we all kind of um, uh, believe in and love. But still, it's it's this is the time as we're reshaping work and we're sh- reshaping our companies. We're going to have to try stuff. We're going to have to, we're going to fail at a lot of stuff. But what I see is this unique opportunity to get even closer with our employees to say we're in this redefinition of work together. Yes, and it's messy, but man, is it worth it? Because we're going to come out with given new tools and new mobile cars or whatever, um, we're going to find some really great solutions that are going to be much more meaningful to us personally and is going to deliver greater outputs and outcomes for our clients. And we look and for it, the and solution. We look for the and solution. We're going back or it's not one way or the other. The two-week uh, time frame, I also think psychologically is very powerful. Love well, it. 
I can live with this for two weeks. And then I know I'm going to be given the mindful opportunity to comment on it. That's a, that's a wonderful paradigm. Wonderful paradigm. Yeah. So we need, we need to, Rachel, we need to go out there and Ginny, we need to go teach people agile, I guess. I think so. I think so. The other thing that you didn't say, but that I would take away from it is if, if you define that organizational drive, those drivers, you then solve um, in an innovative, agile way, how you then adjust how you do your work. I think that nature of that brings innovation to the business. Good so time. you're actually using it as a mechanism to show people a new way. And I, I don't want to put everyone, every company in the classification of everyone wants innovation, but I think that's most. And we're teaching our, to the, your point about getting closer to your employees. This is sort of like living through this gets us a new way of thinking about our business and our, our relationship to the company to be more innovative in the future. We will have we will have captured and succeeded, even through failure, each of these steps, and it will teach us as an organization how to do it again. Oh, I love it. Great. Thank you. Wow. Rachel, thank you once again for a beautiful, we're having a lot of beautiful podcasts these days. Yeah. For a beautiful, beautiful conversation, a lot for people to think about. And, um, again, uh, how can people reach, reach you? Uh, where can they find you, Rachel? You can find me on LinkedIn, Rachel Casanova, like new house or house new one S one N. Um, you can find me, uh, on Twitter as well. And certainly through Cushman and Wakefield. Great. Great. Well, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for, Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. This has been a, a, another great episode of Team Anywhere. If you've loved this episode or any other episodes, please share this episode with your friends and colleagues, as well as comment um, and give us a five-star rating. And until next week, um, have a great week, and we'll see you next time on another episode of Team Anywhere. Anywhere.